Great. Uh, let's give Fiona a round of applause for she leaves. Thank you. It's uh, great to uh, be here and see such a terrific turnout. Uh, thank you, Don, uh, for uh, helping bring this together and bring uh, so many people who serve. Uh, Singh, I, I uh, uh, so uh, admire that you're here. I think that speaks so much to your uh, commitment and uh, to your uh, and to the sense that all of us really this is a, a family and community, and uh, really admire everything you have done. You know, I I know there's been a lot of uh, talk already about the president, and I'll say this: in in some sense, all of you are uh, more qualified than he was, because you've all held in a public service office. When I think about that, uh, he uh, never had done public service. So of all the things that the that I found concerning about Trump, and there's so many to pick from, this idea that you can run to, to be the President of the United States without having even been on a commission or city council the legislature, what um, a sense of entitlement. Did anyone read Todd Nehazy Coates' uh, article in The Atlantic about, it was titled The First White President? Let me ask you as a thought experiment. Asian American announces for president, three times divorced, never having been elected to anything before, what are the odds that that person becomes president of the United States? That's the uh, article that ta Nehezi Coates wrote about African Americans. And so we're in a world in a time where the sense of public service and what it means is under question. And there's an easy sense to say, well, does it, does it matter? what we're doing. You know, if someone can just come along and uh, be on a television show or put in a lot of money and, and tweet out, you know, do I really have to be Gustav Larsen up at 11 at night and, and, or Dave Bonacarsi and go through these commissions and city council meetings? Is that really how we move the needle in this country? You know, there's a sense of is that, uh, is public service what it was w once meant to be? Or are we living in a time where money and celebrity and um, the ability to generate media interest uh, is what shapes the world? I believe, of course, that you know, and I get as offended by when, you know, I, I, I said this about Tom Starr. I said, I don't like, I mean, I, I called for new leadership, but I don't like the idea of some pe of people putting their own money in and just get, expecting public office or not serving in office. I think public service is something that matters because it makes us more connected to community. And it makes us more aware of alternative perspectives and an openness to compromise and an openness to building coalitions and a humility and a sense of uh, imperfection and a sense of uh, not having all the answers. And that's something you get when you serve in the commissions. You realize that that these are tough issues and that there are different perspectives and then not one there's not one right answer and i feel that that service of what you all are doing is so important now at a time where my view is that the the country needs more conversation we've got to lower the volume of our politics we have to uh, you know, I, when I was at a uh, 
at University of Chicago, a professor uh, once said, you always assume that the smartest person in the room is the one who says the least. And somehow our politics has become so loud that we've stopped listening to each other. We've stopped uh, communicating in a way that is trying to find common ground, whether that's in our communities or whether that's in our country. And I think all of you uh, can help change that. Because you're obviously in it for the right reasons. No one goes and serves on a commission or city council or others just for the glory of it. You're in it in a way that's connected to the grassroots of the community, rooted in uh, what public service was meant to be in, uh, when it was envisioned. And you have a ability to take that connection to the community and that ability to listen and help shape a better politics for our area and for our nation. And it's never, I think, been more important because the divide in our country, the fundamental divide, it's not a divide of immigrant versus non-immigrant necessarily. It's not just, it's a divide about whether we believe in America is stronger that looks inward, whether we believe that an America is stronger that resists technological progress, whether we believe in America is stronger that doesn't want to embrace the world, or do we believe in America is stronger that wants to participate in the globe? that wants to learn and grow from the best and brightest and experiences outside the United States as well as inside the United States. And that's really the fundamental divide. And it often doesn't break down just along party lines. And all of us, I believe here, many, most of us have a view of building an America that says, we will do better in the world. We will be economically better. We will be uh, morally better. We will have a better foreign policy if we embrace cultures and insights from around the world. That that is a fundamental strength of the United States. I don't think this is a debate that's going to go away once Donald Trump goes away. I think this is a fundamental debate about the future of America. It's a fundamental debate happening in industrialized nations across the world. A view of parochialism, uh, of opposition to forces of globalization, of opposition to technological progress, opposition to science, versus a view that embraces culture, embraces uh, technology and progress. And I fundamentally believe that we can help shape a vision that defeats the Bannonism, inward-looking parochialism that is animating so much of the Trump agenda. And that's why I think your public service matters. See, it doesn't really matter all that much whether someone is giving a speech on free, at Fremont City Council or on the United States House of Representatives floor. Someone's thoughtful. They could get, someone could be, say something smart and thoughtful as a planning commissioner and have far more people listen to it than, than C-SPAN in an empty house chamber. But what matters is who is, who, what are each of us doing to build a common vision of America in the 21st century? And I think, the, and I'll end with this, I think the contrast with the president 
ultimately is a contrast of the past uh, versus the future. His vision is, I want to go back on its own face. You know, I want to bring back the communities that were left behind. I want to make America great again. I remember those times to the steel workers and the, the factory workers that you were, you were, uh, you had pride. I want to restore that pride. That's his theme. That's his vision. I think that's what he actually believes. Now for us, you know, I mean, you go back far enough and my parents wouldn't have been allowed in this country. But what, what we have to say is not just, well, the president is uh, destroying the Constitution, which he is in ways, or the president's going and telling NFL players they can't kneel, whether the president is inflaming in, in gender and race, which he obviously is, but we have to say something more. Because we have to talk to the people in this country and say, well, what is our vision? They don't want to hear about the president. Do you, does there anyone here who believes that there is a single American who does not have an opinion of Donald Trump? <laughs> I've, I've never understood this with the Democratic Party, because we, we bash him, et cetera. I wanted, I wanted someone to do a focus group <laughs> to see how many people's opinions change based on politicians' commentary on Donald Trump. My guess is it's probably less than 1%. People know where they stand on Donald Trump. What they don't know is where they stand on the future. They don't know whether the immigration that's happened is going to make their kids' lives better. They don't know whether Google and Facebook and technology is going to mean that they're going to be displaced or they're going to have a better future. We have to convince them that the 21st century, for the coal miner's kid, for the steel worker's kid, for the person in a Youngstown, for the person in Beckley, for the person in Detroit, is going to be a better 21st century for them than the past. That they're going to be part of opportunities because of the transformation of technology that they've never seen, that those kids have never had before. That now they can stay in those communities and still work remotely. That, that now they can cooperate with people in other parts of the world to innovate that they may have a 21st century more of peace than marked by two world wars, a cold war, and interventionism and colonialism. We have to give a vision of the 21st century that is going to say, look, this is something. This is going to be America's great century, not the past. It's the future. And that the same platforms right now, I know there's all this debate that Russia, and I don't condone all of that, but the same platforms that gave rise to Donald Trump also gave rise to Barack Obama and Bernie Sanders and individuals that have a greater voice, that we're going to help shape this new century. Now, where is that new century going to shape, be shaped from? Well, I would argue a good place to start will be the heart of Silicon Valley, the heart of a district that has people from around the world, a century that hopefully will not have us as Cold War adversaries with China. I mean, think about that for what, and then I, I know you've got to, I've got to go and you probably want to hear other people, but I've, I've never understood this. Now, folks who say, well, we've got to contain China. Really, I mean, you know what I find so distressing about it is the lack of imagination. Because we did that to the Soviet Union, we want to do that to China, to perpetuate cycles of war and conflict? Do we not have a better dream for humanity? Do we not have a better hope for the 21st century? I think that the values that people bring from every part of the world is going to help America shape and be an inspired actor in the world that's going to make this new century 
a far more peaceful century, a far more tolerant century, a far more, a century that recognizes human rights. And at the fulcrum of that is this district, this area, this place. And so I think every day, and I think all of you should think, what a privilege. What a privilege to be elected from this place, to be serving from this place that can help shape the future of this nation and the world. And uh, that's why uh, I am so admire Don's leadership and Apapa's leadership and all of your leadership to help us uh, build that future. Thank you.